everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is Katie Klump Hensley, and I'm a program manager with Professional and Continuing Education. Glad to have you here today. Uh, today we will be uh, looking at a spotlight on informal learning officials uh, sponsored by Oregon State's Professional and Continuing Education and Oregon State's College of Education. This session is being recorded and will be available for viewing within 24 hours. You can expect an email from PACE with a recorded link. Uh, please feel free to chime in with questions as we go through the webinar today by raising your hand or submitting a question uh, through the uh, GoToWebinar interface. We will try to address as many questions as we can before the presentation is over. Oregon State Professional and Continuing Education engages learners in educational opportunities for both personal enrichment and professional development. We offer hundreds of courses and certificate programs open to the public, which offer tangible value through quality programming and address educational, professional, and economic development goals for you and your organization. PACE partners with Oregon State Colleges to provide amazing opportunities for professional development and continued education to advance careers, foster personal development, and benefit communities of all shapes and sizes. We are committed to bringing the best of Oregon State University to people of all ages and industries, and we are so proud to partner with the College of Education to do just that. So here is our agenda for today's webinar. Um, we are going to briefly introduce Dr. Deerking and Aaron Hicks, and they're going to walk us through a brief informal learning essentials mini lesson. We will quickly review the upcoming course calendar and who to contact for more information. Finally, after our presentation, we'll spend the remainder of our time answering your questions. And with that, I'd like to do, introduce today's webinar guests and informal learning instructors, Lynn Deerking and Aaron Hicks. Dr. Lynn Deerking is a C Grant Professor in Free Choice STEM Learning in the College of Science and Associate Dean for Research in the College of Education. She is internationally recognized for her research in lifelong learning, particularly free choice, out of school time learning, focusing on youth and families historically underrepresented in STEM. Erin Hicks is a museum professional with over 10 years of experience working on the design and development of art and history museum exhibits. Her academic and professional work, as well as research, have focused on interpreting and exhibiting art collections, art education and museums, museum planning, and the economics of art and culture. And with that, we'll hand things over to Lynn and Erin. Welcome. Thank you, Katie. Um, we'll go, uh, if you want to go to the next slide, we'll, um, actually, we'll take the next slide. Um, We'll talk about the overview of what we'd like to talk about today um, in this Essentials of Informal Learning um, mini lesson, so to speak. And um, so what we'd like to talk with you all today, first of all, thank you for attending the webinar. Um, we will address some things um, such as, most importantly, what is informal or free choice learning um, and why is it important? Uh, we'll also uh, touch on what uh, we see the term museum referring to um, and we'll give you a preview of the certificate courses that are found in this professional certificate. Um, Lynn will um, also share with us some recent research uh, that she has been working on and privy to. Um, and then finally, um, I think I'll sum up with uh, how the this OSU certificate could potentially advance you professionally as a museum professional or just a free choice learning professional, or if you're even new to informal learning or free choice learning as well. So um, next slide. Great. Thanks, Erin. So um, I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm really thrilled that um, we have as many people um, today um, to talk about a topic that is very near and dear uh, to my heart and uh, something that I've been working on for um, a long time, shall we say. I'm not going to uh, just, I'm not going to fully disclose how long I've <laughs> been working on this. Um, at any rate, um, uh, the notion of uh, informal or I prefer to call free choice is um, 
anything that's guided by people's needs and interests. And that's where the idea of free choice really uh, fits in. Um, it's the kind of learning that learners do throughout their lives um, when they want to find out more about what is useful, um, something that's compelling to them, um, and also something they may be curious about. I think it's really important to, to make two comments. One is sometimes free choice learning isn't always something that we are really excited about learning about. Um, uh, about uh, 14 years ago, my husband uh, developed uh, leukemia. And uh, I became an avid uh, free choice learner, trying to learn as much as I could about uh, leukemia. And, uh, but I had a tremendous need and desire to learn, and I used a variety of, um, of avenues um, about that. The other comment about free choice learning is um, we changed the term from informal to look at the nature of the learning rather than where the learning was happening. And um, we'll talk about this further, both Aaron and I, throughout this um, uh, webinar, but free choice learning principles can be used by educators of all kinds, uh, classroom teachers, um, uh, uh, outdoor educators, um, uh, people again, working in national parks, um, as well as museums and science centers and after school programs. Um, uh, I know some of the questions, there was even a question about higher education. Absolutely, free choice learning uh, it is very important. And in fact, many universities are trying to figure out how to build more free choice learning principles into um, the courses that undergrads and graduate students take. And I'll finish up by saying, clearly free choice is not a perfect term, but it, it, again, we were trying to shift the, um, the perspective of it from it only happening in places like museums and science centers to the nature of the learning. And what I can say is it's provoked a lot of discussion and debate in the field that I think has been really help, you know, very healthy. So next slide, uh, please. So, so why is this kind of learning important? Um, first of all, we know that uh, you know, our society is changing rapidly and learning is lifelong, you know, it's a, throughout our day, across a week and across our lifetime. Um, if we look at the amount of time that um, a person across their lifetime spends in, um, in formal instruction, and this is going to feel a little bit like I'm uh, going against what I just said about this being able to be both in uh, formal and informal settings. But, um, you know, if you look across the lifetime, less than 3% of, um, of the time that um, a person is involved in learning actually happens in a structured instructional uh, context. And the other thing that's rapidly changing is um, that traditional gatekeeper, gatekeepers of knowledge, schools, actually I'd say universities, um, libraries and government, they're no longer in total control. In fact, I would argue that um, actually programs like online programs, um, master programs, and programs like PACE are really trying to respond to this change in the nature of um, learning. The bottom line is that the boundaries between why, when, where, how, and with whom people learn is really just disappearing. And um, finally, um, learning is continuous and cumulative. And so these um, moments of free choice learning connected again to, to someone um, learning something in a classroom, those all connect to um, build the body of knowledge and um, understanding and um, attitudes that a person has. So next slide, please.
Um, this um, is just a real quick uh, diagram that really tries to show the range of opportunities for free choice learning. And, you know, um, on the um, X axis, we have time across the day. Um, on the Y axis, the lifespan. And then I guess on the the, the z-axis we have um, you know months in the year and this is really shows that issue of we can see where k-12 is we can see college or technical school that sliver of green but there's all this other space that can be filled by um, by free choice learning opportunities again like participating in today's webinar. And um, uh, so anyway, hopefully that, that gives you a sense of why, um, why this learning is so important. So I'm going to turn it over to you now, Erin. Okay, ready for the next slide. <laughs> so um, first of all, we'd like to address um, Generally, because the certificate is um, informal learning uh, as is happening in museums, but museum we're looking at as a broad, a really broad umbrella term. And for those of you who have been affiliated with any museums professionally, um, you are probably familiar with more of the American Association of Museums definition of museum, which encompasses a wide variety of institutions, not just a few, but many. So um, children's museums, art museums, history, natural history museums, also including zoos and aquariums, um, botanical gardens, arboretums, science centers, cultural centers, heritage centers, um, national and state parks, and on and on. Um, but we, what we want to address is that uh, even though there's a description including museums in the certificate that it really um, there's a there's room for all of the other free choice act, free choice learning activities that do occur all around us all day um, including things like after school programs or um, scouting programs book clubs anything in the home um, community gardens what you might be driven or curious to discover in a library. Um, and, you know, I often think about what is the drive that keeps me up at night to watch one more YouTube <laughs> video. <laughs> so, um, but Lynn, if there's something you wanted to add about schools and universities where what you were mentioning before about the formal connection uh, that even within formal graded tuition paying uh, environments, there's still plenty of space for free choice learning opportunities. Yeah, actually, um, uh, you know, a lot of um, universities are appreciating the importance of experiential learning and service learning. And I think those um, those kinds of courses and experiences really begin to to fade into free choice. Plus, um, certainly at OSU, a land grant, sun grant, sea grant, and space grant university we do a lot of outreach and engagement in the community we also have pre-college programs um, that are opportunities for children and youth to come to the university and participate in all sorts of classes so um, uh, free choice learning is alive and well in higher ed <laughs> <laughs> yes and um and the term free choice really um i think where it aligns with museums is because uh it really um museums and institutions like that have always acknowledged the fact that visitors voluntarily attend. Um, especially, I have been working with public libraries, and it's it's even impressed upon me even further how you know a public library's mission is uh, basically never to have an admission fee. Uh, you can enter; everyone can enter, and in fact, you do not. Um, you you only need a uh, library card to check a book out. You don't even need a library yeah. card to walk in or to enter. Um, so it is all of your choice. What book you pull off the shelf or what you experience while you're there is as driven by your choice um, as 
anything. So uh, the last point is that learners are of all ages and backgrounds. Um, also, if in, um, as Lynn mentioned, it is across the lifespan. So um, in sort of the museum world, uh, most people dealing with visitor experience know that visitors will range from, you know, zero to 70 plus. And um, I just heard someone say this phrase, K to gray the other day. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> that's the lifespan. Yeah, um, yeah. So we just yeah, wanted I to can... add, I was just commenting about my gray, uh, Aaron. <laughs> Sorry. We just want to add that um, it is uh, very inclusive. That um, and we try to reflect that in the certificate as well. So, um, all right, we'll go to slide seven. And so, as I mentioned, um, to get a bigger, broader view than just uh, museums, really, there's a web of free choice learning resources that are out there. And you'll see that museums and libraries, um, there's just one circle of many, including schools and universities. Um, the internet is a huge source of uh, content, if you will, print media, um, your friends and family. I like to think of free choice learning too as you know, recipe sharing can be that. Um, Faith-based organizations um, provide a lot of community resources um, and also the workplace. Uh, the workplace, although it might be a little bit more formal, off, typically can offer continuing education um, opportunities that are less formal. And um, so we like to mention this because um, it isn't um, it isn't just a narrow slice of um, learning that we're talking about occurring. There's a broad variety that's quite wide. So, all right, let's see, sli next slide. That's great. Yeah, and I, I, I'll take over for a few minutes here. Um, uh, the, um, the way we think about um, free choice informal learning, um, um, at least the way uh, John Falk, a colleague of mine, and I conceptualized um, this learning is thinking about the contextual nature of learning. Um, and we think about it in terms of it beginning with the individual, um, involving others, and really importantly, involving the cultural backgrounds that um, people bring to the learning experience. And something that, that we tend to not always um, appreciate when we're um, uh, thinking about learning, because a lot of the early learning research was done in classrooms or in labs, and it wasn't necessarily important exactly where the learning happened, but actually learning takes place somewhere. And certainly that somewhere, if you're talking about free choice learning is really important. Uh, museums and science centers and zoos and aquariums are dynamic, uh, spaces, uh, actually going to a national park, <laughs> you're right out there in the midst of beautiful landscape. And so that that somewhere is very, very important. And we, we felt as we thought about the nature of learning that we needed to, to you know, raise um, our, uh, our view on, on that. So um, if I could have the next slide, please. And I know this is a really busy slide and uh, not expecting you to sort of uh, take it all in at one point. In fact, actually, the nature of the course, uh, certificate course, will really allow one to um, really delve into this in more detail. But that learning um, begins with an individual we have described in the contextual model of learning as the personal context. You know, all the things that learners bring with themselves, you know, prior knowledge and experience, their interest in topics, um, actually their familiarity with using resources like uh, in the case of museums or libraries, you know, how familiar are they with these uh, places? Um, the socio-cultural context is all that stuff about learning with others and bringing in um, your, your cultural background. 
So, you know, many people who visit museums um, come in groups that may be family groups, it may be um, uh, couples, maybe still families, but, uh, you know, couples uh, could be um, school groups visiting, um, actually a, a, an increasingly important audience are um, seniors who are visiting these institutions. And um, so there's all the within group uh, uh, mediation that happens, interactions that happen. But also what happens when you walk into many of these places, um, they tend to be public spaces is there are other people there. And so there are opportunities to interact with other uh, people in the learning setting. And in fact, um, uh, certainly museums and zoos and aquariums are working very hard to sort of figure out how to use their staff in supportive ways that actually help um, enhance um, uh, what people who are visiting their, their site are um, experiencing. And then again, important in uh, socio-cultural context is uh, culture, it's, culture itself. And then uh, in terms of the physical context, I like to think of their macro level uh, uh, levels of physical context, you know, architecture, the ambiance, and the feel of a place, as well as more micro level uh, 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 issues related to the design of exhibits. Um, you know, how long are the labels and what colors are used and how easy is it to navigate oneself through, um, through the setting and know sort of where stuff is. I, you know, a free choice setting can only be a good one if you actually feel like you have some ability to <laughs> to have choice. And if you're in a place and you can't figure out what you know, where do I go next, or how do I find something that I'm interested in, that can be a real issue. Um, which is one reason that we really try to talk about that. So, so if I could have the next slide, please, um, Katie. And I think the other uh, thing that we really like to think about in terms of, of free choice, informal learning is that it, it, it's an ability to expand our ideas about what learning is. And by the way, a little asterisk there, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be also thinking about these outcomes in our more structured sort of instructional settings. But, you know, there's tended to be a focus, certainly in, um, in um, schooling, to focus on content, you know, facts and information. But because these settings are social settings, because in fact that social nature is encouraged rather than discouraged, a, a lot of learning happens um, related to learning about um, oneself and about others, um, both one, one, uh, others in the group that you arrive with and others who may be um, uh, visiting at the same time that, that you are. We also learn a great deal um, as, about aesthetics in these settings and um, very important, figuring, we are supporting people learning how to learn. You know, how can they access and find that information and those experiences that will um, really make a difference in their lives. And um, we like to think this doesn't always happen, but the, the goal is that big band at the bottom, you know, this transforming sort of, um, of experience. So um, if you could give us the next slide, and Erin and I are gonna sort of talk together a bit uh, over the next two slides, so. Okay, do you want me to start, Lynn, or would you like to? By, by, by all means, you can jump in and, yep. <laughs> okay, well, we just wanted to go over what the certificate courses were and a little bit of what um, would, uh, the, the format of the certificate. And so um, the more like logistical details, involve um, the fact that the course is a total, in order to complete the certificate, you um, need to just complete four courses and uh, three of the core and one elective, although many people choose to do both, uh, both electives, which we'll get to in a moment, but the core courses are um, a branch off of what Lynn has already been talking about, these 
contexts, the um, three main contexts of the contextual model of learning. Um, so the first class in the sequence starts in the fall, although you can, this is, it's rotating at any point. You can jump into the cycle at any point. You can take one class if you wish. Um, uh, I do think there's a slight discount for taking the whole certificate. Um, but the first class is the personal um, context. Uh, and so the title is examining the learner's own ideas, the personal dimensions of free choice learning. And um, the second course then is the sociocultural context. And um, uh, basically, conceptually, I think if Lynn, maybe maybe this would be a good time if you wanted to talk about the concepts in in the personal context class. Yeah, well, again, I, I probably talked about them in the previous slide, but in the social, uh, you know, as as I said, the personal context is what we, you know, learners bring to the um, to the situation in the sociocultural context. We're looking at, at um, this macro level of sociocultural, um, uh, and I know from some of the questions there was interest in, you know, the influences of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic level, and class. Us. And, you know, many of uh, museums have suffered in the past, quite honestly, being called elitist. And one of the things that museums are trying to do is to reposition themselves to be more, um, more like a library, although unfortunately, many museums have, um, have fees um, to enter, although uh, there is a trend in some communities to make, um, to support museums to being free, um, but the, someone has to support that. And so um, the California Science Center, for example, in LA has always been free. And every year the uh, director has to go to Sacramento and he does his, you know, important talk about how important this Science Center is with, by the way, it's right in, um, you know, uh, uh, Southeast LA, where a lot of the issues, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of um, difficult times have happened both in the 70s and more, more, uh, more recently. And, um, and then there's that micro level of how, you know, if you're there with a family or you're there with um, a class, the, all the interactions that happen uh, there, as well as how you interact with other learners um, and staff in the um, in the setting, and I'll just jump down to the physical context, and you can wrap it up with the 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 course, Erin. Um, Again, it, with that physical context, thinking about um, as I said in, earlier architecture, novelty of settings. Um, you know, if children uh, live in you know, the uh, urban areas and they go out to a nature center, even though all of us think nature centers are grand, um, there's research that shows when kids get off the school bus, they're looking around for the lions and tigers and bears. And that's a, that's a legitimate feeling for them to have if they haven't had opportunities to be outdoors in nature. And so we have to take into account um, those um, uh, issues. Uh, something uh, that's really important that a lot of uh, museums try to keep on top of is making sure that the place is clean, bathrooms are clean. Um, you, it, even if it's the best museum, if you have a bad experience um, with, you know, a dirty, messy, uh, smelly restroom or um, uh, a meal that doesn't quite meet your um, your standards when you go to have a meal at the place, that influences the, um, the nature of um, the experience. And then, you know, the micro level, really, the quality of the exhibits, and, and quality can be in terms of the, the opportunities to interact, um, physical space, and actually something that museums are finally learning about, not all yet, but comfort, having um, places to sit and rest and, um, uh, you know, places to get a snack and, and so forth. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's that slide. So I think we can move to the next one. Oh, no, Erin, you need to 
talk about the <laughs> math courses. Sorry, I got so excited that we should move on. So. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, I'll just mention that within each of these courses, um, participants, you will um, obviously learn about the material that Lynn just covered, but um, you'll also end up with a product. So at the end of each of the courses, you're um, working towards a final project. So um, especially for those working in um, museum environment, uh, you might end up with, um, say, for example, in the personal personal dimensions course. Um, you'll work on a front-end evaluation that will inform your process for creating uh, a free choice learning environment or experience um, of your choice. And it's very broad. The courses are built so that um, there is a lot of room for interpretation of whatever project you want to work on. There's a lot of room for you as a professional to bring in a, maybe a problem or a scenario that you have been wanting to work on um, so that you can uh, use what you're learning in these certificate courses, especially these core courses, to apply directly to your professional situation. When I say professional too, you don't have to be a paid employee. You can also be a volunteer. We've had many students who have volunteered in organizations and um, have had great luck in presenting their, the ideas that they work through in the courses based off of the content of the courses, uh, presenting them to say, you know, um, you know, administrators at a at a park or something um, who were really receptive to the information that the project provided. Um, so in the sociocultural uh, course, you'll at the end, you'll be working on an observational study that will inform um, how sociocultural influences, as Lynn mentioned, race, race ethnicity, socioeconomic level, et cetera, will, can inform um, your free choice learning environment or experience. And um, Specifically in the physical dimensions course, you work on a prototyping process. So you'll have this great chance to take um, a free choice learning environment or, ex or experience, maybe an exhibit, and directly work on a prototyping, ex uh, prototyping study so that you can better inform your process and better inform your uh, exhibit. So let's, now we'll Hit the next slide. Now we can go. <laughs> uh, Actually, um, I think this is your your slide, Erin. <laughs> All right, and so to supplement those core courses, we have um, we have elective courses, and um, one of them is evaluation. Uh, you can learn the nuances of evaluating free choice learning environments because they do differ from formal environments. Like we had mentioned, those more graded, you know, where grading is involved. Um, as the famous museum quote goes, "You can't flunk museums," so there's no grades given. <laughs> Thank yeah. goodness. Um, so in the course, Developing Effective Evaluation Studies, um, you will learn the steps of, of eva evaluating an informal environment or experience um, so that you can kind of still ask the question, you know, you can pose, has learning occurred? Um, and, and learn some ways in order to um, quantify what is a little bit typically more difficult to quantify. Um, and then the, uh, the last selective course is um, developing STEAM curriculum, which really uh, focuses more on developing curriculum for an informal free choice learning environment uh, by using um, an educational framework um, and you can apply that to, you can, we're calling it a curriculum, but it's loosely defined to include um, any educational programming for free choice learning environments or an exhibit, uh, just, you know, sort of a website um, or any kind of situation that might apply for you. So that is sort of the overview of the certificate courses. You can go to the next slide. Great. What I'm going to do in these next two slides is very quickly because um, we want to have time to hear more about the um, the importance of the the course. Just talk about some of 
the research that in, in two cases I'm doing, but also research that students have done. They were not necessarily um, certificate students, but, but they were involved in uh, free choice learning. Just to give you a sense of the range of kinds of, um, of work that counts as being free choice and informal. Uh, I have a study right now um, in uh, Portland, actually, actually, both of these studies, uh, the first and the second, are in Portland, and it, it uh, we're using the term design research. We actually have been collecting um, information about the learners and the nature of the community and the different partners that are there, and in the case of the first um, uh, project, we're trying to figure out how we can use the um, research we've collected to better connect what um, uh, middle-aged um, youth are doing in school and outside of school. And we're using the three C's. We learned those um, from our research. And the three C's are about customizing a learning to the interests of, um, of youth, uh, connecting to family and community, and then of course, coordinating in school and out of um, school. And that project um, actually has been working now and called Park Rose working on a project. And by the way, um, I had to leave a meeting. Um, I'm here at OMSI, uh, actually, uh, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry today, participating in a museum, uh, in a meeting that involves the, um, the second design research. Um, I'm working on a project, we're calling it Yes STEM, but actually we call it Yes STEM because that was the name the youth wanted to call it. Um, this a project is all about youth voice and trying to find out from youth um, uh, how we can support their participation in, um, in science, technology, engineering, and math. And I will say both of these projects are related to science, technology, engineering, and math, but um, that's because I can get money from the National Science Foundation, but I am not an ideologue about, um, about uh, science uh, uh, learning uh, per se. I, I'm very interested in multidisciplinary learning, and I know Erin is as well, and that's really an important uh, part of this, um, of this uh, certificate course. Um, another uh, study that one of my students did was to um, look at home educating families. She looked particularly in the uh, Willamette Valley, where Oregon State University is physically, and she studied a group of home educating families and actually uh, discovered that they were engaging in home education for a variety of reasons. Some for think of when we hear the be for religious reasons, but because of their strong belief about the nature of learning and wanting their children to have more um, more opportunities to have choice in their learning. Actually, they also were choosing this because they want to learn with their children as well. And families, that was a big part of home education was that adults and families learn together. And, um, and what she also found that they were engaging in a variety of practices. Some were very traditional. I mean, the kids had a schedule and they spent an hour on math and an hour on English. And, and then other families um, that call themselves unschoolers were tending to wake up in the morning and figure out, well, what are we going to learn about today? So um, if I could have a slide, um, uh, the next slide, I'll share a couple more and then turn it over to Aaron to really talk about the um, uh, the focus. Um, actually, a, a student of mine, a master's student, just finished a study where um, she uh, created what she called, it was sort of a quick and dirty citizen science program where um, children were taken outside of their classrooms, but they were still on the school grounds. So this is an example of 
integrating free choice into um, uh, schooling. And it was a way for, um, it, it was a, uh, it was called a bio blitz where over a period of a couple of hours, uh, children were um, given the task of trying to identify as many of the different species of plants and animals as they saw on their school ground and built into this program um, uh, and built built in um, values around nature related to, uh, you know, native Hawaiian um, students. Um, another uh, student studied koi hobbyists. If you don't know what koi are, um, they are, uh, this is over stretching a bit, but they are very big, colorful goldfish. Um, uh, they are very expensive. Um, they, in part, they have no uh, stomachs. You have to feed them. Uh, constantly, and they're very, you know, they can be finicky. But this person studied koi hobbyists, and he looked at people who were just starting, and what do they, how do they engage in being a koi hobbyist? And then he was able to look at the learning progression to becoming a master koi hobbyist. And not all people became masters. Uh, sometimes, again, when it's free choice learning, learners get to make a choice about whether they're going to continue that pathway. Um, some people thought, you know, it was too expensive or, you know, it was, it, you know, there were a variety of reasons why they might not, uh, you know, proceed. Uh, and then one final uh, fun uh, thing that one of our uh, students has studied here, he's looked at a science pub in particular particular one in New York City called Astronomers on Tap. And this is a, you know, uh, uh, I think it's a monthly experience uh, at different pubs around New York City. Uh, and a, a professional or amateur astronomer comes and talks about their work. And of course, there's adult beverages involved in this um, in this experience. But, um, you know, he's looking at why are these adults um, participating and and what are the takeaways? What are they learning by participating in um, this astronomers on, on on tap? So that just gives you a couple of ideas. Again, emphasizing what Aaron said earlier, um, this is very flexible. And um, I know from many of your questions, we have a very diverse group of people who are participating um, today in the webinar. And um, uh, I think there's room to um, really work with uh, many of you to design something that would be um, of use and relevance to you. And that's what Aaron's going to really be talking about next is how important you know, how much the certificate has been designed to be of use and of, of purpose to, to someone. So I'll turn it to you, Erin, um, and the next slide. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so yes, how will this certificate advance you professionally? Um, well, first of all, uh, as Lynn has alluded to, free choice, really, free choice learning is really at the cutting edge of what some refer to as 21st century learning. Um, it's sort of a new way of looking at learning and how learning is occurring and the situations and settings that learning can occur. Um, so it potentially, um, this certificate could set you apart, uh, whether you are working in a museum-like setting or a school or just sort of any learning environment. Um, it also adds value to the workplace. So as I mentioned before, the program really is designed um, specifically for working professionals. There is uh, lots of leeway and understanding for professional demands and realities. Um, so the theory is there, there's reading, uh, but there's also uh, there's literature to draw from, um, and the theory is there, but there's also tools and skills that you can apply directly to your situation or environment, um, wherein everyone can benefit. Those 
visitors to your environment, other coworkers, yourself, um, administration, or, you know, um, in addition to that, um, the certificate has um, attracts students um, nationally, and um, I know we've had some students from Canada. So um, you would be a part of a national or international network of other professionals working in free choice learning environments. And I just was uh, looking through some class comments uh, just recently and one student remarked how it, at certain points during the course, um, maybe they were overwhelmed by their own workload or they were overwhelmed by their own, the, the working reality of their uh, museum environment and that um, they were able to go to the discussion boards, which are, um, you know, populated by discussions of all students. Um, and they were able to just read through the discussion board and and come up with new ideas simply by being exposed to so many other students across the country and otherwise and um, finding other work environments. I personally have had a curiosity. I've always wondered, you know, I always like to wonder how could a library um, benefit from what a science center knows? How, what, how could a nature center benefit from what an art museum knows? Uh, what, how could a library benefit from what a children's museum knows? And so this network of free choice learning professionals sort of opens you up to that through a discussion board or otherwise you would have access to other professionals you can ask direct questions to, have a conversation with and a dialogue. Um, I also wanna to mention too that if you sign up for the full certificate, what typically ends up happening because it's a year in length is that um, you'll end up crossing over with the same people and you almost move through a little bit like a bit of a cohort uh -huh. um, which you would find um, great benefit in that there's still the same students traveling through that um, you kind of start to get to know and you recognize their work or you might be able to draw from their professional strengths um, in order to help you professionally as well. Um, and as the last sentence says, you can learn how to make it fun for the learners <laughs> with whom you work. <laughs> the free choice <laughs> learning should be fun. And, um, you know, the environments that you work in, I think uh, museums uh, especially have high pressure. They have a lot of pressure these days. And uh, taking the certificate, I think, is a great place to learn some skills, to be able to um, go back and take that to your institution and apply them for improvement, and just for sort of the benefit of the visitor experience as a whole. So. Uh, yeah, Aaron, Aaron uh, I might add that actually, um, uh, I think that um, one of the things I've observed, uh, certainly over the uh, uh, time you mentioned cohort, is um, those students uh, begin to be colleagues and they continue their relationship after the, um, you know, after the program. And so um, they find people who either, you know, maybe that library person finds the science center person and they start playing around with, uh, you know, the idea that you're curious about or there's just someone that they know they can talk about the trade with and maybe uh, you know a blow off some steam if it's been a bad week or a bad day so um, I think that's one of the you know it's not something we talk about as being an outcome of the program but um, I think that uh, it's 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 wonderful to see um, people continuing to to participate in that you know that learning community that this um, course creates agreed so I think that pretty much wraps <laughs> up our presentation um, I guess we're ready Katie for the next step sounds good thank you Lynn and Aaron for sharing your expertise with us the Informal Learning in Museums program begins this January with two courses, um, Understanding Cultural Influence, Sociocultural Dimensions of Free Choice Learning, and Developing STEM Curriculum. Uh, both courses are fully online and begin on January 7, and they run for seven weeks. Um, 
like all OSU professional and continuing education offerings, these courses offer a unique opportunity to learn directly from Oregon State's free choice learning and informal learning experts. And we hope you'll consider joining us for class this January. And with that, we'll open the, door, the floor for a few questions. I know we're running out of time, but um, we've got a couple here that we can, um, we can share with you, Lynn and Erin. Um, first question, as a formal teacher, a formal classroom teacher, how can I adjust my teaching, teaching style to incorporate some of this? Hmm. Well, I can, I'll jump in briefly and then maybe Erin can, can add thoughts. I, I, the example of the, um, that uh, bio blitz program um, at the Hawaiian um, middle school was, you know, these were teachers who were willing and by the way, had administrative support to, um, to take children outside and participate in this special program. So that's a great example of that. And I will add that one of the things that this program gives you is some um, ability to go to talk to administrators, uh, particularly I would say in in schools, but even in some museums and science centers, people can, in administration, can be stayed and sort of old fashioned in their ideas. This gives you an opportunity to, to go and make, you know, set up a meeting with a director or um, your manager and say, you know, I'm learning about this whole new uh, way of thinking about learning. And um, let me share with you, here's some things you might want to read or um, I'd like to try some stuff. You know, one example is thinking that um, you don't have to think just about your classroom as um, as the place you do learning. Um, uh, offering uh, uh, children some um, options and choices when they're doing projects. And by the way, free choice, sometimes people think, oh, you mean you're just giving kids all sorts of choice. Actually, what we've what we've learned from um, free choice research is that if, if you give, if, if there's no choice, it's not a great situation. And if, if, if it's totally choice, it's pandemonium. And the um, part of what you learn in the curriculum course in particular is how to structure um, the learning so that it's, um, you know, there are maybe a few choices. So those are a couple of ideas. I don't know if you have others, Erin. Um, you know, I would just uh, mention that um, basically having a willingness to uh, be open to more informal activities, um, free choice activities, I think in a formal setting, I know I've had students come through the certificate who are, uh, who are formal K-12 teachers, and they, it isn't as though they haven't already integrated free choice learning activities into their um, ex yeah. their classroom, it's that they just didn't call it that. Um, and so a lot of times I think there's uh. a, an image that they're you thinking that you'll have some loss of control, um, but something as simple as what's done in informal science learning, like a table talk activity, is um, really free choice learning. That ch the student or the child would decide what to touch, or um, or like a touch tank, or even in a library setting, um, you know what book do they are they attracted to that can it can even be something simple like that that's um more in the vein of free choice learning so great thank you both so much we are very quickly running out of time so we might hold the rest of the questions um if you do have additional questions for lynn aaron or for the pace office um encourage you to get in touch with us um, you can contact pace at pace at oregon state.edu um, or phone number is also listed here uh, if you have questions for Lynn and Erin, feel free to send them to the PACE office and we'll send them on um, to have them answered for you. Um, again, on behalf of Oregon State's Professional and Continuing Education and College of Education, thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you, Lynn and Erin, for sharing your expertise with us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Katie. It was a yeah, it was a pleasure. Um, uh, I wish I was more excited about this topic, but um, I try. <laughs> <laughs> We appreciate it. Thank you both. Thanks. Great. <laughs>